Hello and welcome to this round five here at Pro Tour Hour of Devastation. We are well and truly into the standard rounds here at the tournament. Myself, Tim Willoughby, alongside Hall of Famer Luis Scott Vargas. And we're beginning to get a feel for some of the options that people have brought to the table here at Pro Tour Arab Devastation in Kyoto. Still got quite a few interesting decks, and we're going we're to get a chance to see a few more of them in our feature match area right now. Let's head down and kick things off here for round five in Kyoto. Hello and welcome to this round five of Pro Tour Hour of Devastation. I'm Tim Willoughby, joined by Hall of Famer Luis Scott Vargas, and we have a whole bunch of great plays in our feature match area for you. We're going to be kicking things off on our main table with Makahito Mahara from Team Last Samurai. There you can see him. He, of course, has not had to travel quite as far as many for this tournament and has had a great start thus far, 3-1, and one, and he's up against Tim Harris from the USA, who's had a little bit further to travel, I think it's safe to say. Uh, these guys are going to get a chance to show off what they brought to the table, and we're kicking things off on Harris' side of things with... Well, we've called it Ramen Up Red because this is the a very aggressive red deck that's really been powered up by the likes of Ramen Up Ruins. And this is kind of the default aggro deck of the format, uh, I think it outpacing Mono Black Zombies in popularity. And if, you, if you're not equipped to deal with this deck, you're going to have a hard time this tournament. A lot of people have chosen to play Mono Red. So Solskar Major was the first play from Harris, likely to have some sort of follow-up here. Uh, actually kicking things off on turn two just with a Sunscorched Desert. That gets in a point before a Battlefield Scrounger comes, a Scrap Heap Scrounger, sorry, comes along to help out. On the other side of things, uh, Makita Mahara is on red-green ramp, and there's a number of great options in terms of getting lands into play quickly in this format. be interesting to see exactly what he's... Uh, trying to accelerate into. Some of the decks varying a little bit in terms of what they've got going on there. But Druid of the Cowl, the first play from him, and that one he'll be very happy, has a relatively healthy toughness here. And much like Josh Utter late in last round, uh, you're going to see a ramp into World Breaker and Walking Ballista. Some pretty cool high end with uh, one copy of Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger. I guess we can't escape Ulamog even now. Yeah, and I know that Brian David Marshall very excited about the potential for turn five Ulamog. Uh, the way that that most frequently happens is uh, if you're able to cast one of your really big ramp spells early early on. Let's have a look at the, the ramp that's available to Mahara. The big one is Arab Promise. A lot of ramp spells when they're fetching up lands are only fetching basics. The difference with Arab Promise is you can get any land and that includes well, some pretty powerful ones in the likes of Shrine of the Forsaken Gods so that you can be generating a whole ton of mana with your uh, five mana ramp spell. But for now, Mihara kicking things off with that A Walking Ballista, which might help him stop the bleeding a little bit, though he's had to cast it for a relatively modest amount here in the face of the aggression coming from Harris. There is Chandra Torture of Defiance coming from Harris. He has the option here of just using it immediately to tick down, but instead it looks like he's got extra mana, and that means an abrade on Walking Ballista. A parting shot just going at Chandra so that she stays at foil loyalty this turn, but no blockers left for Mahara, so he takes another big old chunk from uh, the likes of Tim Harris's team. That uh, Soul Scar Mage does have prowess, so it did get a little bit larger thanks to those two spells played this turn. And this puts Tim Harris significantly far ahead. He's got three attackers on the board, you know, counting Chandra, and enough mana to play anything Chandra flips, as well as a pretty dominating board presence to begin with. Though, Thought Not Seer is pretty big. Thought Not Seer, kind of a cool one. One of the uh, things that we've seen from a few decks is that because they're running deserts, and deserts naturally tap for colorless mana in addition to whatever else they've got going on, it does mean that Eldrazi show up in a few interesting uh, different decks. In fact, some of these red decks do have a top end that includes the likes of Reality Smasher, though I think that in the case of Tim Harris list, he's being a little bit more low to the ground. Yeah, this is the, the lower curve red deck, and uh, he, despite the fact that he has colorless sources, he just doesn't have uh, any Odrazi at the moment. Yeah, the Sunscorched Desert, a very straightforward way of getting a little bit of extra damage in, but really interacting well with Ramanap Ruins as and when it shows up. And it looks like uh, Mihara there, we can see that there's a Kozilex return in his hand. He may have to lean on that pretty hard if he wants to get past this early beatdown, but on four life, he's, he's got to kind of keep his fingers crossed at this point. Yeah, he's got to hope that uh, he finds an answer to Chandra as well, because Chandra just by herself uh, threatens lethal in two turns. Well, there's a Scrap Heap Scrounger on top. Looks like 
Harris more content to just get damage through with her than uh, accelerate anything out. And there is Kozlek's return, getting to get an Earthshaker Kenra alongside everything else that was going on from uh, Harris. But now the Kenra's in the graveyard, there's enough mana available that can also get eternalized. This red deck attacking on a lot of different axes and making life very tricky for uh, the member of Last Samurai. And Chandra, it, it looks like is she is going to, to finish the game here. Uh, as Mihara looks for an answer, but he doesn't have a whole lot of ways to, to deal with her. He can play a walking ballista for two if he, if he draws that exact card. Uh, Tim Harris, his life total entirely untroubled thus far in the game. Druid of the Cal comes down, but it seems unlikely that that's going to be enough. Reveals Ramanap Runes. That's one way that Ramanap Runes can end up dealing <laughs> two damage to opponents. Yeah, one of many. It's got a couple paths to victory there. So a very quick victory there for the red deck uh, in the hands of Tim Harris, game one. We will get a chance to see a little bit more of those two in action soon enough. But first, these messages. Want to play in the next Pro Tour? Qualifiers are happening this weekend on Magic Online. For more information, visit mtgo.com. Up your game with Ultra Pro Magic the Gathering accessories. Find the best magic art on card sleeves, deck boxes, playmats, and more. Visit ultrapro.com to learn more and find a retailer near you. Welcome back to this round five here at Pro Tour Arab Devastation. We can already see a fair amount of shuffling going on. We've had a number of games already finish uh, their game one, but we are going to get a chance for a little bit of a look in before we jump back to our front table match with Makihito Mahara. We've got Seth Manfield, former world champion, up against uh, Keita Kawasaki. And for those of you that like this Ramanat red deck, there's plenty of it in the feature match area this round. Manfield on the red deck. He's got Hazaret the Fervent facing down against the likes of Ishkana Graf Widow because Kawasaki, he's on black. Black Green Delirium. We spoke earlier on about the notion that there are various decks that have maybe not been making as much of a splash in uh, the feature match area the last couple of Pro Tours that have kind of seen a bit of a resurgence uh, with this Arab Devastation standard format. And it looks like Kawasaki going for that option. Yeah, Traverse the Ovenwald, you know, maybe not as big of a player as it was um, some months ago, but it is back and Ishkana still does a pretty good job of stabilizing the board, though Hazard the Fervent does eventually clock the opponent especially given enough time. It looks like uh, we do have Seth Manfield on a relatively low number of cards in hand, but there is a new card coming from Keita Kawasaki here, the Locust God coming down for him, and that... Uh, sorry, the Scarab God coming down for him, and that meaning that he's got a few different ways of getting damage through and indeed improving the quality of his draws. So Seth Manfield's path to victory a little bit more sort of straightforward, I suppose, but this game, far from over. Yeah, using Scarab God on a Noxious Gear Hulk is a pretty good way to, to, to get back into things. And it looks like Kawasaki is in, in quite good shape. Ramanap Bruins does a pretty good job of finishing the opponent, but when your opponent's at 14, it's got a lot of work to do. 
Yeah, there's already been one Noxious Gearhawk played this turn, this game by Keita Kawasaki, and that one of the reasons that this is a game one that's gone on a little longer than we've seen from some of the other decks uh, in our feature match area. And I guess that the the dark side of using Hazaret the Fervent is that if Hazaret's active, that means that you're more or less living off the top of your deck. Meanwhile, Keita Kawasaki, yes, he doesn't have a huge amount of life to play with here, but he has access to a whole lot of cards. And he's actually got Seth on a fairly quick clock as well. Uh, the Scarab God delivers a beatdown, and... As long as Kawasaki can make sure he doesn't die on this next turn, he he he's, he can probably threaten Seth's life total over the course of two turns. Yeah, Noxious Gearhulk in the graveyard, one of the ways that he's going to be able to pad out that life total if need be. Yeah, if, if Keita Kawasaki can na navigate his way through this turn and perhaps one more. I think he's in good shape. And there's, in terms of lifelink, there's another way that he can go. It looks like he has uh, a few more options available in hand. Yeah, Kalatas Traitor of Get is another option that he has available to him in hand if he doesn't want to go for the act activation on his god here. Uh, how Kawasaki navigates this turn is going to be critical, though, because if he gets too aggressive here, that opens the door for Seth to, you know, potentially finish the game with an Earthshaker Kenra or uh, another Oncrop Crasher or something along those lines. Yeah, one thing that I've seen a lot from these red decks, and I've, I've played a fair amount of them online, they're quite popular there, is that they can threaten a lot of hasty damage. So even if it looks like you've got good blocks going into a turn, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to stay that way. Sylvan Advocate in play here for Kawasaki. Plenty of lands to work with it. And there's Noxious Gearhulk. Killing off Ishkana. Nice play there. That's the way that he's going to be able to get the most life gained. And he's just removing it slightly from the sleeve there to make it clear that this is effectively an eternalized copy of uh, the Noxious Gearhulk. So it's, it's a 4 4 zombie. Bomat Courier coming down. I, I mentioned there's lots of haste in these red decks. That not necessarily the scariest of haste creatures that can be presented by these Ramanet red decks. Though at least it's an additional card here for Seth. Turns out that card not good enough. That Keita Kawasaki picking up the first game against Seth Manfield. And we get a chance to jump back to our main match, that between Makihito Mahara and Tim Harris, to see whether or not Mahara, after sideboarding, can find a way of dealing with the lightning fast decks that are being played on the red side of the table. So this time on the play, we can see that there's a little bit of black mana available to some of these red decks. That largely just for Scrap Heap Scrounger, so you can get it back exactly when you need to. Yeah, it's like the lightest of splashes, just four black lands for maybe the activation on one card. So kind of a, a, a funny little addition here. Drew to the Cal, not also high on the list of cards I would have expected to see in the standard portion of the Pro Tour, though I suppose it's slightly more likely than the limited portion. And second verse, kind of the same as the first for Tim Harris here, able to just deploy potent <laughs> one drop, Scrap Heap Scrounger on turn two. You can see two copies of Arncrop Crasher in there. The haste on them, plus the ability to make blocking difficult, means that they're potentially a, a nice pickup for this Thought Not Seer that's come down a turn early. <laughs> turn three Thought Not Seer, uh, the hard way. No, no Drazi Temples here, just a uh, Druid of the Cow. Sometimes that's all you need. And just the three toughness on that Druid of the Cal kind of, I would guess, one of the reasons that Mihara has leaned in that direction. Yeah, on Crop Crasher proving uh, not only a limited standout, but doing a pretty good job in Constructed here. Exert, meaning there are no blockers available for Makahito Mihara. Drops to 12 on that swing. And this red deck reminds me a little bit of the the old red uh, red green rocket shoes deck from Pro Tour Tokyo from a very long time ago now lots and lots of haste creatures makes it very difficult for opponents to keep a board stable tim coming with a reference that uh, <laughs> probably six people in chat in, 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 in chat could understand but you know what those six people <laughs> hopefully love they're them. like extremely happy that that's the best kind and 
the good thing for this red deck is that sometimes it can start chaining together these ways of stopping blockers. Um, Arncop Crash are kind of the gold standard on that. Uh, occasionally, you get to use uh, Earthshaker Kenra to do a similar sort of deal, but when there's the likes of Thought Knots here there, four power, meaning it's enough that it's unafraid of uh, what's going on the other side there. Big, big Kozlex return from Makahito Mahara to clear things off. Hanwe Garrison, the follow-up from Tim Harris, as he's trying to find a way of continuing the assault on Makahito Mahara's life total. Drew the Cal conveniently surviving Kozlex's return, at least the front half of it. It's kind of funny, every now and then you see a card like Kozlex return or Thought Not, so you're like, right, these cards are still illegal and standard. We haven't seen them in, you know, see play for months at this point, but... Uh, the Odrazi are back, World Breakers uh, and Thought Not Seers abound. Interestingly, looking at Mahara's hand, plenty of action, but not very much in terms of mana. His ramp deck doing a relatively poor job of getting lots of mana available to it. Though I guess Sh Chandra might help out there soon enough. In the meantime, though, Arncock Crasher coming in. This time, no exert, because basically, he doesn't mind too much killing off that Druid of the Cal. He can see that there's been missed land drops on the other side of the table. And Mahara declining to block. 12 life apiece here as we get into the, the mid-game, and another copy of uh, Kozilek's return picked up by Makahito Mahara here. And surprisingly, Tim not using a, a, the abrade in hand to kill that Druid of the Cal, given that Mihara is stuck on three lands, that seems like a very uh, appealing play to make. Uh, saving the mana for Scrap Heap Scrounger in the graveyard. That black mana, we mentioned it on turn one, ended up being important here, getting additional threats on the battlefield. Here's the Kozilex return, though. Well, the Scrounger will c continue coming back, so that's that not the biggest loss in the world, but still that, uh, that a braid getting saved for by presumably a better target. Soulscar Mage coming down. It's a 1-2 with prowess for one, and actually its ability here may prove relevant because it turns non-combat damage into, uh, I guess, wither damage. You put minus one, minus one counters on instead. And that means that this abrade here, it can deal three damage to the Thought Knots here, turn it into a 1-1, one, one, at which point prowess plus the uh, the size of the Soulscar Mage is enough to kill off the Thought Knots here, though. And abrade on the other side, helping out a little bit with that, and actually meaning that before uh, Harris's abrade can resolve, uh, there's no wither to be found. And that whole sequence did not work out particularly well for Tim Harris. Walking Ballista also joining the team for Makahita Mahara. Not got a huge amount of mana to be able to sink into it just yet, but his is a ramp deck if he's able to start playing his bigger spells. If he can get that Hour of Promise off, at some point the Walking Ballista could become large and in charge. Finds another land, but it is going to enter the battlefield tapped. At least there... There's the, the one desert to work with so far for Mahara, so he might even be able to do good things with Arrow Promise. The, the, the mono red deck has had more, more lands in play than the ramp deck for basically every turn <laughs> you know, of, the, of this game. Yeah, I don't think either player necessarily too happy about that turn of events. Right. Life totals six to four here, though. It's been an old-fashioned sort of slugfest between these two decks, each having to figure out a way of uh, navigating perhaps a kind of spotty draw. We've got a, a score update for you. On our back table, Pierre Dajon of France, one of the players that's vying to be the national captain for France, defeating Antonio Del Moral Leon on our back table. Zombies taking down the Red Menace. And match is falling thick and fast. Makis Matsuka is picking up his game even as our main match on the front table goes to one and one. That means that there's not too many matches still going on here in our feature match area. Looks like there's sideboarding going on. We may be able to see a little bit uh, of another match just as our main table figures out what they're going to do for their big decider. Well, this is a fast format, and we've uh, featured some fast decks this round. So when you have mono black zombies against mono red, you're, you're going to not play a tons of turns of, game, of the game. We're going to get a chance to see a little bit more of Seth Manfield in his matchup, though. We saw uh, Keita Kawasaki um, dealing fairly handily with uh, what the red deck had going on with his black-green delirium. This time around, it looks like we've had some early Bomat couriers that each now have a few cards under them. Uncrop Crasher, meaning that they can attack relatively unimpeded. And Seth Manfield here, very much the aggressor. 
we can see the, the combination of deserts aligning quite nicely for Manfield in this uh, game too. Chandra, Torture Defiance coming down. Does he have another spell to cast with additional mana, or are we potentially looking at her as a removal spell here? Well, if Seth decides to use Chandra as a removal spell, it actually puts him in a nice spot where if he takes out Sylvan Advocate, the Tireless Tracker could still attack Chandra, but that would tap down the, the, the tracker, opening the door for Seth to attack back for a decent amount of damage. Looks like that's exactly what he's going for. For now, those Bowmoat Carriers on defense, but it would not surprise me at all if that turned around relatively quickly. A lot of potential cards uh, to be drawn in future turns here for Seth Manfield. That nine by his name indicating that he's currently ninth in our top 25 players and a former world champion. The nine doesn't denote that, but also true. <laughs> Defeating uh, Owen Turtwald in the finals of that world. Yeah, absolutely fantastic finals, that one. So Keita Kawasaki, he's found a land in order to be able to make a clue. I believe that that's actually one of the APAC lands. A Euroland, even. Oh, yeah, even better. So Kawasaki does kind of feel forced to attack into Chandra. Manfield doesn't mind throwing the, the Bomac Courier with fewer cards underneath it into the graveyard. Uh, Walking Blister coming along, and with four mana, he had enough to be able to shoot both the other Bomac Courier and Chandra. Nice turn there for Keita Kawasaki. It does open him up to getting hit by Oncrop Crasher, and with Ramen Up Ruins and two deserts in play, Keita is certainly not out of the woods yet, but that was a good turn. He did clear three troublesome permanents off the board. At least there wasn't another haster there. I mean, taking three points here, not ideal, but it could have been worse. And a, a relatively quiet turn for Seth there, all told. Now Kate is going to have to start racing his removal against uh, Seth's clock here. And a nice pick up in Kalatas Traitor of Get there for Keita Kawasaki. Lifelink relevant. Also, if he does find ways of removing the creatures on the other side of the battlefield, he can go wide relatively easily, making zombies every time he kills off anything that Seth Manfield's got going on. Seth with another Sun Scorched Desert. And wow, if you're looking for a big threat to play, they don't come much bigger or better than Glorybringer for these red decks. Not necessarily something that you see from all of the red decks, certainly in game one, but having the access to another big haster, at least in sideboard games, very potent indeed. Seth Manfield pushing things to a game three there against Keita Kawasaki. So it looks like on our front table, they're just getting ready to kick things off. We'll see if we can jump across there and see how Makahito Mahara doing it against Tim Harris. Just see. We're just going to see if we can sort out that little, little issue further there. We, we can see that we've got both these players on 3-1, and Ramanat ruins into Bomat Courier, the starting play for Harris. Gets to attack in for the first couple of turns unimpeded, thanks to the fact that it was an un untapped land for, uh, sorry, a tapped land for Makahito Mahara. And these uh, scrap heap scroungers, they just keep on coming for Harris, and they seem to be a really nice addition to this red deck, even though they re require a little bit of extra colored mana to be able to make everything work. Yeah, Tim, uh, sending a message with that Bomac Courier into a scrap heap scrounger, which is a resilient threat. Kozak's return is still pretty annoying. It's not the card he wants to see out of Mihara, but if he can draw foreboding ruins, then yeah, that uh, scrounger will just keep coming back. And looking at Harris's hand, he's got kind of a, a bit of a mix going on in terms of going big and going small. As and when a Kozilek's return comes along, he can kind of repeat exactly what his early turns wa were. But if he can get up to five mana, we saw it work for Seth Manfield. Glorybringer, just a big threat from these red decks. And it works out that, uh, yep, he's just doing exactly the same on turn three as he achieved on both turn one and two, kind of forcing uh, Makihito Mahara's hand here in terms of finding and playing a Kozilek's return. Ramanat Ruins coming from Mihara now. Well, if, he, if Mahara does not have the Kozak's return, he's in a lot of trouble. And given that he didn't cast it now to clear out those Bomat Couriers before Tim untaps with mana, uh, it seems a little less likely that he has it. it looks no, like looks he like might, like might well do, though. He's, he's waiting until uh, Harris's upkeep to do this. 
Interesting. Now, Harris now needs to decide whether or not the three cards that he has in hand are better than the three he could get with one of those Bomat Couriers. Looks like he likes the ones that he's got, because he's got a Hanwir Garrison there as a follow-up. One card that on its own can represent a pretty hefty amount of damage. Some of these red decks do have uh, both sides of Hanwear Garrison and Hanwear Battlements so that you can potentially get some writhing townships going on. Not necessarily something that's in all of these lists, though. No, this is another big turn for Mihara, because if he can't answer the, the garrison, then he'd be in a bit of trouble. But looks like he can. So the life totals here mean that Mihara is a little bit behind, but... If we, if we can reach a point where actually Mahara can start powering out some of the threats in his hand, could be kind of a problem because seven damage in the early turns, actually when you get right down to brass tacks, isn't all that much from these red decks. Hour of Promise meaning that now Mihara gets to search up two lands. Any lands in his deck are fair game for this one, and I think it's safe to suggest that he's not going to just go for basics here. If he ends up with two deserts in play, which... Seems fairly likely, yes, he's going to get two zombie tokens in addition to having ramped his mana pretty solidly. It's a big turn for Tim because if he hits a land drop, then he can play a Glorybringer and he can start pressuring Mihara in the air. If he misses this turn, he might be too far behind to get the, that plan into action. Yeah, there's just a pair of Glorybringers in hand for Harris. Finds a land, but you know what? Scorching Ruins, when you already have four lands in play, it's coming to play tapped. He doesn't have anything else going on so he's just gonna have to sit back and watch as Makahito Mahara does his thing at least for this next turn. Now well, there is a cost to splashing Scrap Heap Scrounger and that, and that foreboding ruins coming into play tap does mean that Tim was just unable to play Glorybringer giving Mihara the, the first uh, opportunity to get something out of the board here. And hours begetting more hours. And this will, of course, mean two more zombies for Mihara. And this time round, he doesn't need to worry about finding any more copies of deserts. He's got the deserts in play that he needs. This time round, Shrine of the Forsaken Gods, meaning that now he just has crazy amounts of mana going on. And with Walking Ballista in hand alongside Thought Knots here, Mihara, future turns for him looking pretty good. And actually using scavenger grounds here to, in order to exile all those uh, scrap heap scroungers before they come back. I like that. I mean, that's the reason it's in the deck, right? It's most, mainly to fight against God Pharaoh's gift, but scrap heap scrounger is a nice pickup too. Well, you know, when when you have the opportunity to do so. So Glorybringer coming down and Glorybringer there just attacking in straight up. Uh, Harris basically looking to try and close this game out with damage rather than worrying about killing off a single zombie. Mihara lining up an impressive array of lands here all of a sudden. Oh yeah, Mihara's got some great options here. Thought Nuts here, Walking Ballista, Chandra, he, w uh, along with a two-turn clock on zombies, I think that Mihara is going to be able to close this game out because he can deal with the, the glory bringer. he can make sure that Tim doesn't have anything else going on with Thought Nuts here, and he can really just close the door. So, Ethersphere Harvester was the pickup for uh, Tim Harris. That one getting to stay in his hand as glory bringer gets exiled. Chandra then deals with the other glory bringer. And Tim Harris, he's you know, he's in check now. That was an attack for eight, just eight life remaining for Harris. Even though he wasn't able to pick up game one, it looks like Mihara here might be able to close out the series. And even if Mihara did not have a braid in hand, he he would be in a pretty good shape here between all the zombies and the thought knots here. But he does have both a braid and walking ballista, so Tim Harris is not going to be able to, to survive another turn. Yeah, an embarrassment of riches there, and the handshake comes from Harris. You can see that the jig is up. That a win for Makahito Mahara. He advances to 4-1 and one here at Pro Tour Hour of Devastation. Congratulations to him. And, of course, we had a number of other great matches going on. We got to see the various uh, strengths and weaknesses, I suppose, of the Ramanak red decks. But we're going to get a chance to jump across and see a, the last little bit of Seth Manfield against uh, Keita Kawasaki. This, the final iteration of uh, Ramon Up Red in our feature match area for this round. Uh, Earthshaker Kenra coming down simply as a two-power haster on turn two here because no creatures just yet for the Black Green Delirium deck.
walking ballista coming down as a 1-1 one -one and uh, traverse the overmeld there. Just be able to search up a basic, but sometimes that's all you need. It says something about how this format's looking, at least for our feature match area, that this is our last game in the feature match area, and there's still 21 minutes left on the round. Well, we had uh, very, you know, various versions of Ramen Up Red in three of our four matches today, so or in this particular round. So, unsurprising that things went fairly quickly. Actually, all four of our matches. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, in the interesting bit for me being that. Not all of those matches were won by the red deck. Normally, if you've got red decks uh, doing things quickly, it's winning. Um, when they're losing quickly as well, though, we've got kind of an interesting format on our hands. Uh, Unclock Crasher coming along, uh, attacking in. The Earthshaker Kenra bit getting killed off, but that's not necessarily the end of the world for uh, Seth Manfield. At some point, that Kenra may come back as a four-power haster. That was a good exchange, though, for, for Kato, because he was able to block shoot down the Kenra, take no damage that turn because Seth chose not to exert. And then this turn, he's got a couple different options here. He can play a Walking Ballista for two if by playing his untapped Swamp, or he can play, it looks like a Gonti Lord of Luxury. But the choice that he's up against is that if he plays Swamp instead of Evolving Wilds, he can't necessarily play Ishkana next turn. So it looks like he's going to forsake the guaranteed Ishkana and instead just play one of his four drops. All right, so he gets to take a card from Seth Manfield's deck here, looking at four. What sort of thing do you think he's going to be looking for here? He would love to find a removal spell or like a mid-sized threat. Earthshaker Kenner is actually a little annoying because if it dies, it does end up going to Seth's graveyard. So that it to, to be eternalized later. I guess that Kata can basically treat it as a, a two-point burn spell that's ready if he really needs it. Even if it works out that Gonti gets killed off, that card that's exiled, still fair game uh, to be able to be cast. And for any mana colors that you like. Still have to pay the full cost, but black mana will work just as well as red in this instance. Team Genesis having a pretty fantastic tournament thus far. Uh, came out of the limited rounds with very, very strong performances in spite of the fact that Martin Mueller had to play um, against a teammate in the finals of his draft. A braid dealing with Gonti and an unimpeded attack for three here from Seth Manfield. Falcon Wrath Gorger there coming along as the follow-up. Largely a Savannah Lions in this red deck. I guess that there's the potential to do things with Hazaret perhaps uh, if you have a second copy of the Falcon Wrath Gorger, but that a relatively narrow case. Most of the time you just simply see uh, it as a 2-1 for just the one point of mana. Two two walking ballista matching up kind of nicely here. And once again, Seth choosing not to exert because he feels like uh, he can get more value later with the on-car crasher. Uh, that didn't work out great for him in that it just let Kata trade by after blocking the Falcon Wrath Gorger. So I'll block and then remove the counters to shoot the Uncrop Crasher. No damage taken that turn for Kawasaki. Let's have a look at what Manfield's got going on. Chandra, Glorybringer, Collective Defiance, and Soulscar Mage. Quite a lot of reach with that hand, and it's a, it's one of the sort of larger hands, I guess, something that can do with more with more mana than some that we see from these red decks. Collected Defiance, the interesting one that it can damage creatures, it can damage players, and if you really need to, it lets you cash in your hand. Still, playing a, a Planeswalker against an empty board is always appealing. Ticks up, generating some mana, letting a Soulscar Mage come down. I guess it's the empty board, but we know there's still that exiled uh, Earthshaker Kenra that is at least one creature that can attack the Planeswalker. Kawasaki has Delirium, so if he can get up to Ishkanar, that's going to be a good way of him starting to stabilize here. And whilst, while being at 15 still, he, he doesn't like taking damage from Chandra, but he's able to survive a turn of Chandra, and uh, getting Ishkanar onto the board Seems like it's going to do a, a lot of good work for him. There she is, bringing 
three spider tokens with her. Kawasaki seems to be well prepared with his various tokens, all ready to go. Ishkana has, also, of course, been a while, been around for a while ever since Eldritch Moon. Oh yeah, fighting through Ishkana is a time-honored tradition. And Seth's two ones uh, and one twos don't, don't don't look quite so hot. And then in the face of an army of spiders, but Sean just still lets him get through for a little bit of damage. He's got. Like you said, some heavy hitters, Hazaret, Glorybringer, Collective Defiance. These are all like, large, impactful cards, though. The disadvantage is that not only can Seth only play one a turn, he can't even play the Glorybringer yet unless he wants to tick up Chandra. And uh, Ishkana does a pretty good job of, of fighting against Glorybringer now that it comes down to it. And, of course, the reach on these various spiders, a bit of a pain in the neck for someone that's looking to go over the top of the dragon. Slight advantage there for Keita Kawasaki right now. Most of what Keita Kawasaki has going on is pretty much on the table and never to return in hand there, which will potentially mean that if a big threat comes down, there's something that Kawasaki will have to say about that. The fact that he's been able to navigate his way through to this stage of the game, having only taken five points of damage, a great sign. These red decks really want to get through as much damage as they can in the early turns before this sort of thing is possible. Yeah, these red decks have a lot of good ways to push through the last five to seven points. Getting 15 through, this isn't a modern burn deck. This, you, you're not playing Lava Spikes and Boros Charms. You've got, yeah, Ramen Up Runes, Collected Defiance. You have a, a, a couple things. I like that play last turn. So Kita chose not to play a six land. He intentionally missed a land drop, and now that Seth used Collective Defiance to make Kita discard, that actually paid off quite nicely. Worth noting as well that the Collective Defiance, because Soulscar Mage was in play, has put a lot of minus one, minus one counts on Ishkanar, which does take the edge off the big spider quite a bit. Burn spells taking on a slightly different meaning once Soulscar Mage is in play. Kita now running pretty heavy on lands, and because even though it worked out better to discard that land and draw an extra card, he actually can't activate Ishkana on seven anymore, though he does have that never to return that he can cast out of his graveyard. And there we see it. Getting rid of a Shaker Kenra now, so it's not going to get a chance to be eternalized. I like that. And a zombie will come along also. So many tokens. Now, at what point does Keita Kawasaki need to worry about the ever-increasing loyalty of Chandra? We don't see too many Chandra ultimates, but it has to be something that Seth's at least keeping in mind. Well, it, it certainly looks like it's going to be relevant soon here. Keita might have to make it some attacks here. Earthshaker kind of looking not bad on Keita's side of the board. Yeah, that Soulscar Mage not able to block this turn because its power less than the less than or equal to the Earthshaker Kenra's. In this case, less than. A fairly straightforward block and trade so that Ashaka Kenra goes to Seth Manfield's graveyard. And Chandra's loyalty ticking down just a touch. But this opens the door for Seth to just potentially like slam a glory bringer. You could also, thanks to Chandra's plus one, that uh, adds two red, eternalize Earthshaker Kenra and make it so something like the zombie is unable to block attacking for a substantial amount of damage. So Seth has some good options here. If he glory bringers down the zombie, then his Chandra is safe, and that's got to be an a, a appealing line of play, especially since Kawasaki did not play the Hiss and Quagmire out of his hand. Since he, he, he had six mana worth of plays last turn, but that led him to a point where he, he's, he's going to be unable to attack Chandra. So incendiary flow there, the way of dealing with the zombie, and that leaving the door open for Hazrat the Fervent to come along. And with just one card in hand, that means that Hazaret immediately being able to get stuck into this red zone. And here you see Seth winning a long game. He's he's actually at a point where he, I think, is doing a very good job of, of beating an Ishkana, beating a Never to Return, two Walking Ballistas by just playing these four and five mana spells. Hazaret, Chandra, Glorybringer, these, these are all adding up. 
Yeah, I think that it's it's very easy to consign red decks to being these quick early decks that are looking to play powerful curves, but not necessarily looking to do big things on turns four or five. And that not quite what this uh, Raman up red deck ends up doing. Because it's, it's only going to take one more land before the Ramanap Ruins that's in play also gives another source of damage that's coming through. There's there's a lot of different ways that this, this deck can reach out and deal damage to your opponent's head. And what, what you see happening is game, in games like this, where in game one, sets are very low to the ground, tons of one-drops, uh, aggressive red deck. Your opponent boards in cards to stop that, and you board in cards that cost four and five mana and just go over the top. And that looks like it's working out quite nicely for Seth in this game. I mean, an Eternalized Earthshaker Kenra here could be a big problem for Keita Kawasaki. Seth does have a lot of incentive to play a card out of his hand, though, so Hazret can attack. So if he doesn't draw a land here, then he there's a decent chance he wants to play a Glorybringer or some other card that makes it so Hazret is uh, ready to, to fight. There is the Glorybringer. Big swings here coming from Manfield. Threatening nine points of damage even when leaving the Soul, the soul Scar Mage back. So exerted glory bringer enough to push damage through, and that's the handshake. Seth Manfield picking up the win there for Team Genesis, and of course himself advancing to four and zero in this tour. Uh, sorry, five and zero in this tournament. Uh, couldn't ask for a better start from that. Ramon up red. I must admit, in my testing prior to this pro tour, getting a feel for the various decks in the format. The red deck was kind of the one that I was excited by, and it looks like I was not the only one when people came to figuring out what deck they like. It's kind of the the scary one that can make the people that are trying to do big things get a little bit worried, but as we've seen, it can also go late if it needs to. Yeah, it's a very powerful deck, and uh, I think it's going to end up being one of the most played decks in the field. Fantastic stuff. We will, of course, have three more rounds of Standard for you soon enough, but for now, we're going to close things out here from the feature match area and leave you with these messages.
I'm actually fairly sure that this card isn't in his list, so Makis Matsukas can't really be Greeks bearing gifts ungiven, but he is waiting for us down on the floor, and he's at 5-0 and with Brian David Marshall. Thanks, Rich. I think uh, I'm here with Marcus Matsukas, and we're talking about your start to this tournament, your 5-0, and there's a lot of things going on for you here, but you said job one right now is winning the Draft Master? Uh, job one, even though it's a cliche, is uh, winning the next match. I know it sounds boring, but it's the truth. But uh, other than that, job number one is the Draft Master, yes. Yeah, no, uh, that would get you an invite to Worlds. Uh, what, what would that mean for you to be uh, able to play uh, at the World Championship? I mean, uh, it is the most prestigious tournament and uh, even competing, it doesn't matter how well you do, even competing is one of the most important things. It's a great honor, I think. Now, you're also eligible, uh, you're, you're out in front for the yes. Rookie of the Year? No, no. Uh, for the Rookie of the Year, I'm, a, I'm second behind Ben Hall from Canada. He was in the top four of uh, Pro Tour Calades. So he's the favorite. But uh, I would say that I am the favorite for the Greek national team captain. Okay, and so what's happening there? You, 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 are you running away with that or do you have someone right up there for you? Uh, my friend Panayotis is here in Japan and uh, he's the, he's, except from Bill, we are the three people in the race. I think uh, Panayotis has a decent shot to catch me, but I will try to stay in front. As long as you just keep focusing on that next match, it yeah. should all work itself out, right? Exactly, exactly. All right, Marcus Masukas, good luck the rest of the way here at Hour of Devastation. Cameraman Jack taking you around the floor. Players are gearing up towards uh, round number six. As BDM says, Marcus Matsukas has so many irons in the fire uh, this weekend. That is a super smooth. Look at that. How awesome is that? Japanese Pro Tours are the best. Fantastic stuff. Um, get a glimpse at some of the players gearing up uh, for their show to Yasuoka Hall of Famer. Um, part of Team Masashi, of course. Now, they actually, after four rounds, were not doing great work. They actually were under 500 after four rounds. We'll check, on, uh, check in on them in a little bit, but the door's slightly ajar. Remember, they were 25 points clear of Team Genesis. More about Team Genesis in a little bit. But right now, it's deck tech time from Team Eureka. It's Valentin Mackel with Maria.